Lord, I thank you that right now we have an opportunity to expose ourselves to timeless truth. That, Lord, you're going to allow us to really orient ourselves with the plan that you had before the foundations of the world. The lamb was slain before the foundations of the world. Lord, so much of our um, emotional upheavals, <coughs> excuse me, are often rooted in a misunderstanding of your plan for humanity, for creation, of Jesus, of your nature. But Lord, you preserved in your word revelations of what this all means so that we can be a people who frame our worlds by your word and become people who are um, resolute and, and sure-footed and have a clarity to our understanding of why we're here and what you've done. We're not confused by every wind of doctrine. May you use this teaching today to really build us up, that we, your sons of glory, would shine, that we would be able to demonstrate to this world um, that we believe in, in something and someone that makes sense, that, that was a plan, that we're not here by chance. We didn't evolve, we're not happenstance. But Lord, you um, had a great plan in your mind and we're experiencing it in Christ. Lord, we lift up every um, husband that's represented here and we ask, Lord, that you would apprehend him with your love, with your truth. That, Lord, each husband would know what it means to be the man of God that you intend him to be. We lift up children who are backslidden, rebellious, or confused. And we ask that you would reveal yourself to them such a powerful and penetrating way that they would cling to you. For those children and grandchildren that know you, we ask and pray, Lord, that they would get a further, um, they would further propel in this race that they are running. They'd be encouraged. They'd be strengthened. They'd be baptized with the oil of joy. And we'll Lord, we lift up ourselves, that we would be women who um, are not moved and led by our feelings and perceptions, but the truth of, of everything that you say, <clears throat> we truly order our steps. In Jesus' name, amen. I drink of water. Okay, good morning. It's good to see all of you here. Um, I mean, today we are in week six. We're in Hebrews chapter three. We're beginning the third chapter. This semester, we're only doing half of the book of Hebrews, and the next semester, we'll do the rest of it. <clears throat> I can assure you that as you stay committed to the book of Hebrews, you will find yourself extremely um, settled in, in life <laughs> and understanding who God is and enjoy discovering how it all fits together. Hebrews 3, verse 1 says, Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, Consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus. Now, therefore is a big word. Because therefore means because of these other things, I want you to consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus. What's the therefore? Well, everything that was stated in Hebrews 1 and Hebrews 2. So therefore means because Jesus took on a human body, because Jesus became a man, because Jesus tasted death for everyone, because he destroyed the devil who had the power of death, because he has released people from the fear of death, because he is able to assist or aid us, because he was clothed in flesh, because he's better than the angels, so much better, consider Jesus Christ. It says, therefore, holy brethren, Partakers of the heavenly calling, consider Jesus Christ. What's consider mean? And consider means to perceive or observe fully. Absolutely make it your aim to wrap your mind around all that Jesus had done and everything that he is. We must take a much deeper and thorough look at Jesus Christ. It only takes faith in what he's done, simple faith to be saved, but it takes consideration to appreciate the salvation. We must really take a closer look at him because of who he is, because of the fact that he had a human body. And he says, consider Jesus. <clears throat> and who is it addressed to? Partakers of the heavenly calling. 
So now the Jewish believers and those of us who are reading this book understand that our identity is called partakers of the heavenly calling. Aren't you learning a lot of new phrases? You know, learning like captain of our salvation or um, what was the one about the majesty in the chapter one? Majesty on high, majesty on high, thank you. Majesty on high, captain of our salvation. Now we learn something about ourselves. That we can look at each other and say we are partakers of the heavenly calling. Jesus came from heaven. He had a calling, didn't he? From heaven to become human, to dwell among us, to taste of death, so he can destroy through death him who had the power over death. Well, we have a heavenly calling as well. Let's look, uh, a, a thorough look at whom we have placed our trust in. In this verse, it calls Jesus, the verse describes that Jesus is called the apostle and high priest of our confession. What does that mean, our confession? Well, confession means to agree with, by the way. It doesn't mean to speak out loud. The Bible talks about if we confess with our mouth. The with our mouth is the out loud. Confess is to agree. It comes with the word fess, F-E-S-S is a Greek word, fess, which means to speak, and C-O-N means with, speak with, to agree with. Confession means we agree with. That verse in Romans says if we agree with our mouth, if we say, yes, I agree, and we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. So when we confess our sin, it doesn't mean we say it with our mouth. It means we agree that it's sin. We say, yes, this was wrong. We might say it out loud. We might confess to one another. I might agree out loud with someone. But confess means to agree with, to say, yes, God, this was sin. Yes, I agree that Jesus is Lord. And he's saying here that he's the apostle and high priest of our confession. It means that Jesus is our confession. We've agreed that he's the way. We've agreed that he's the life. We've said, you know what? He is. I don't know about you, but before I got saved, I didn't necessarily agree that he was who people said he was, or even what the Bible said he was. I, I was like skeptical. But there comes a time when someone confesses the Lord Jesus, it means they agree that he is Lord. They agree that he's not just a teacher, that he's not just a, a good man, but they agree that he is Lord. He is God incarnate. He is the unseen deity now seen with our eyes and experiencing death dying and rising again. It says that Jesus is the apostle and high priest of our confession. Now apostle, what does that mean? It means one that is sent or a messenger. Remember we learned that Jesus was a messenger of the covenant? That he is the apostle of our confession. He's the one that we agree has been sent to do everything that we needed done for us. We have to realize that, that I agree that, that Jesus was sent. He wasn't created when he was a baby. He was sent from heaven. He pre-existed and he was sent. Some of you go, ah, that's old stuff, I know that. Well, there's some of you that are saying, going, I didn't know he pre-existed. We have to agree that he was sent here from heaven. He was the word made flesh. So he's the apostle of our confession and he's the high priest of our confession. We will look even more, I know I keep telling you that, we're gonna look more in thy priest, but it does come later that we look at this very, very detailed. And you're gonna never, you're never gonna know how much you appreciate knowing him as high priest until we really look at it and we go, oh my gosh, that is like a really neat thing. I know that's kinda of like, I feel like I'm giving you teasers or previews. I know yesterday my husband and I went to the movies and we went into a theater, because I only go to theaters that have recliners because I don't like movies. I really like recliners, so I'll go. And I you could just, I usually bring a blanket and sometimes I just go to sleep for about 20 minutes of it. But we actually went to a theater, they just did it two months ago. They just made it in their recliners. So there was none of that smell of popular you know, old stale, that some people like and think is novel. I, I don't particularly like that, but we went in and we sat down in these recliners and ugh, oh, mm, it was great. And I was laying there and I was just experiencing this. And we sat down to watch the movie. 25 minutes of previews. Tw of movies I know I will never see. 25 minutes. But I was in a recliner and I had caramel corn. So those two kind of trumped that frustration. 
But what I'm saying is they show trailers so that you'll come back and watch the whole movie. So I'm saying every time I keep saying, yeah, we'll get to the high priest thing later, think of it as a preview, although you're not in the recliner. But you can think, wow, I want to see that movie. I want to learn about that high priest thing. He is the apostle and high priest of our confession. Let's look at how he is this apostle. How is he the messenger, the sent one? How can he be the one who stands in the gap? And we're going to look to the book of Hebrews and, because it says, consider, behold, perceive. Well, do you know that by going through the book of Hebrews, we're obeying this very verse? How exciting is that? Because it says, I need you, therefore, because he's done all this, I need you to really grasp this. I need you to take time to look at this. We're obeying this verse by studying the book of Hebrews. We're saying, you know what? I, I want to know Jesus better. I want to understand how he's the high priest. How is he qualified to be the high priest? What does that even mean? Let's look at Jesus. Let's consider, let's perceive and behold in detail the apostle and high priest of our confession. Verse 2. Who was faithful to him who appointed him, as Moses also was faithful in all his house. So what's, what, what do we learn about Jesus here? He's faithful. He was faithful to whom? To him who appointed him. Jesus was an appointed Messiah. It isn't like, well, you can get to heaven through Jesus or Buddha or you could always go through Allah. No, no, no. Jesus was appointed to be the Messiah by God. He didn't, like, he didn't say it could be any of these. He appointed Jesus to be the Messiah. He was faithful to him. He had a heavenly calling. His father was calling him to be the Messiah. Well, remember, we learned that we're partakers of this heavenly calling. Isn't that exciting? It means that with the same sense of purpose that Jesus lived on this earth, he wants you and me to live with that as well, that we have a heavenly calling in our lives. So what do we need to be? We need to be faithful like him. Consider him who was faithful to him who appointed him. He was given this assignment within the Godhead, within the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus took it seriously, and it was his mission and his calling. When he came to earth, he came to earth with a sense of calling from heaven. He did what his father, I don't know where the verse is, but I love where he, he just said, I always do those things that my father asked me to do. And, and some of us are frustrated with our lives because you know why? You want to do some of the things that the father asked you to do, and then you want to do the things that you're going to do even if the father didn't want you to do it. You're going to marry who you're going to marry. You're going to do the career. You know what? Give it up. When you think you know what's best for you, you don't, and I don't. You can always tell the Lord the desires of your heart. Like, I think he's cute. I would like to do this for a profession. And he may say, yeah, go ahead. But we need to remember that we, like Jesus, have a heavenly calling. And we say, what was I created for? What am I appointed for? What did you create me to do with my gifts, with my story, with my testimony? God has a plan for you. It says that he was faithful to him who appointed him, as Moses also was faithful in all his house. Now this is neat, because you know Hebrews, they really like, Jewish people like Moses a lot. I mean, he's like a key figure in the history of the nation of Israel. So the Lord <clears throat> is likening Jesus' life and mission to Moses' life and mission. This would be very relatable for a Jewish believer. So they go, oh, so Jesus was faithful to him who appointed him just like Moses was faithful in his house? Using Moses was very important to Jewish people. They greatly esteemed Moses. This would help a Hebrew believer transition and hold on to Jesus when he could say, I'm allowed to liken Jesus to Moses? And you and I, you know, most of us are not Jewish and we have no problem with it, but we can get excited about learning how Jesus, Jesus' life patterned a Moses' life. In John 9, 28, uh, the, the, um, the Jewish leaders reviled Jesus and said, you are his disciple. Oh, excuse me. And he said, you are his disciple. They were, they were talking not to Jesus. They were talking to one of the disciples. They said, you are his disciple, but we are Moses' disciple. We know that God spoke to Moses. As for this fellow, we don't know where he's from. 
So see, they were confident that God spoke to Moses, and rightly so, because God did. But they didn't believe that Jesus was anything like Moses. And so now they're going back and saying, look, just like Moses was faithful in his house, Jesus was faithful to him who appointed him. Acts 15, 21 says, For Moses has had throughout many generations those who preach him in every city being read in the synagogues every Sabbath. So the Jewish people heard from Moses' writings, you know, which was the first five books of the Bible. They would listen to Moses' writings all the times, many generations, it says in Acts 15, 21. Jewish person after Jewish person was acquainted with Moses' teachings, being read every Sabbath. So for the Jewish person, there was honor, familiarity, esteem for Moses. Let's look at this next scripture about what even the early Jewish believers had heard about Moses and how he fit in with being a Christian in Acts 21. This verse is in the midst. So we're back here when he's being talked about in Acts 15, 21, Moses has. Then it says, let's see, the next verse. This verse is, is when Paul came to Jerusalem to speak with James and the other elders. And he came and reported all the neat things that were happening among the Gentiles. And this is what the elders said in Acts 21, 20. That when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and they said to him, you see, brother, how many myriads of Jews there are who have believed, and they are all zealous for the law. Now, this is very interesting. The Jewish believers were so blessed by these things, they glorified the Lord, and they told them there are myriads of Jews who believed. They're so zealous for all they have been raised with that when they saw how Jesus fit in, they were able to believe in, in the Lord. Because in Acts 15, 21, it says, Moses has had throughout many generations those who preach him in every city, being read in the synagogues every Sabbath. But back in Acts 21, 20, it says, uh, wait, I'm sorry. It says, when they heard it, they glorified the Lord. They said to him that all these Jews had believed because they are zealous for the law. Verse 21. But they have been informed about you, Paul, that you're teaching all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying they ought not circumcise their children or walk according to the customs. Did you hear that? Jewish believers go, wait a minute. You're telling everybody to forsake Moses, which Paul was not, which the gospel was not. And, and, and forgive me, because this wasn't the next verse. This is a different part about about when Moses was being challenged among the Jewish people. They were believing, they were zealous for the law, but they were saying, Paul, you're going around and telling these people to forsake Moses. And Paul was kind of saying, no, I'm, I'm going to the Gentiles because they don't have to do everything that Moses said. But you Jewish people that believe in Moses, you're welcome to build upon Moses. We're not forsaking Moses. So you can see where the Hebrew believers reconciling with the non-Hebrew believers, there was a little confusion early on. And this letter was trying to say, look, Jesus was faithful in all his house, just like Moses was. We're not forsaking Moses. If you're a Jew and you believe in Jesus, I can even show you how Moses patterned the very things that Jesus later did, and Jesus patterned the things that Moses used to do. They've been, they said, you teach all the Jews among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, and they, they shouldn't circumcise their children, they shouldn't walk according to the customs. This was the reputation that Paul had there in Jerusalem. So that says in Acts 21, 22, what then? The assembly must certainly meet, for they will hear that you have come. So the elders, the Jewish believers, called Paul in to explain, what have you really been teaching? Are you telling people to forsake Moses, forsake all the customs? Like, we're very confused as Jewish people what we should do. In Acts 21, 23, they had a plan so he could be better received in light of the rumors that have been going on about him. And Jewish believers might have heard, like, I don't understand, we're supposed to forsake everything? In Acts 21, 23, this is what they said. They said, therefore, do what we tell you. They told Paul, because the Jewish believers are very confused. We have four men who have taken a vow, verse 24. Take them, be purified with them, pay their expenses so they may shave their heads, and that all may know that those things of which they were informed concerning you are nothing. 
but that you yourself also walk orderly and keep the law. Like at the very beginning, he said, look, you need to show the Jewish believers that, that you're not saying that Jesus is throwing away everything to do with Moses, that everybody has to walk away from everything they've heard. So we need you to really do something super Jewish <laughs> so they can say, oh, he's a Christian and he's still doing super Jewish things. And this is so interesting because some of us might have come out of certain, I know I came out of a denomination, and for years the Lord told me to every time I was at my parents' house to go to my parents' church with them regularly to honor my heritage and not to like be all arrogant and like I can't go in that church, but to show that, you know what, I can do this and it doesn't mess up the gospel and this is our heritage and I can honor my parents' heritage. And, you know, the Lord didn't want the Jewish traditions to um, be something that people can look at in the light of Christ and understand that he fulfilled them. As a fact, we understand and we, we really consider Jesus better when we look at him in light of the traditions. And so Paul was told with these other people, shave your head, do these Jewish things, so that Jewish people are not so confused with becoming Christians. Just meet them where they're at. And we always have to remember that sometimes the Lord will have us do that. He'll have us just meet people where they're at so that we don't start making things that are minor the major things. We just kind of, hey, I'll meet you on this level, playing field, and we'll, well, let's get to know Jesus. And later he'll take care of all those, those deals. This is um, also, by the way, when he did this, it was right before Paul was attacked on the Temple Mount. And when he goes to prison, never to be released after this. <laughs> so you know, he went and did this whole thing, and it didn't work out so great for Paul in his experience. It worked out great for us because he went to jail and he wrote all these great epistles, so we're really happy that he did this. But um, it does make you wonder whether he might have written Hebrews in response to this. Um, because he, he never really got to do the whole vow thing. He went to the temple to do this and to pay his expenses and he got arrested. So he never got to show the Hebrew believers that he didn't negate Moses' teachings. So you wonder if he wrote the book of Hebrews because, well, I might as well write the book of Hebrews because I never got to do the whole paying expenses and shaving the head and all that stuff. But he was told to do it. And um, verse 3, it says, For this one... Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. So this one is Jesus. And it's saying here, remember we learned that Jesus was so much better than the angels. Well, here it says that he's been counted of more glory than Moses. So Jewish people would have been the angels, they would have been to Moses. You think, no, he's, he's bigger than Moses. Moses received so much respect and admiration he was in a place of being quoted, emulated, and listened to. And here we're being given an illustration that he who built the house has more honor than the house. He's basically saying, if you love Moses, I, I know who built Moses. <laughs> if you love what Moses did, Jesus is the one who told him what to do. If anything you love about Moses, it's because Jesus made Moses. <laughs> and so, you know, any, and that's what's kind of neat. I know for me, um, I love my husband and I love my children. And, and you know, knowing that unless God heals me, I'm gonna die um, in a shorter amount of time than I would have thought. Sometimes I get sad, oh, my kids, oh, I love my kids, oh, I love my people at church, I love my husband. I go, you know what, anything I love in this world and anything I love in my kids and my husband, if I love what's built into them, then think how neat it'll be in the presence of the one who built it. Like anything I would miss on earth has been put here by the one who built the things that are here on earth. So I think heaven's kind of a neat thing to look forward to because he that built the house is worthy of more honor than the house that's built. Anything we love here, glimpse of the beauty of the God who made it, whether it's marriage or having children or being at church or being used by God, is being used by God better than God himself? No. Jesus is the builder. Verse 4. For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. Just like physical houses are built by people, there isn't a house that doesn't have a builder. All things are made by God. And sometimes the Jewish people were more into the agents and the ways and the forms 
than they were the God who used the agents and the forms and the means. And oh, that we would be guarded against these things, that we would remember anything we love and enjoy. It, it, it doesn't compare to the God who created the things that we love and enjoy. And so he's basically saying, Moses is neat because God made him neat. Moses' truths are from God. Moses' calling is from God. So he's saying Jesus is worthy of more glory because Jesus is the one that sent Moses. Verse 5. And Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterward. Jesus was, Jesus was faithful just like Moses was faithful. His life, his body, his mission. What happened in Moses' life was a testimony of things that would be later spoken. From whom? Not the one who got the covenant, but the messenger of the covenant. The word made flesh from the Lord Jesus' mission. Verse 6. But Christ is a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. Christ is over his own house. John 10, 17 says, Therefore, my Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it again. Verse 18. No one takes it from me. So see how he's the Lord over his own house. He's the Son over his own house. No one takes my life from me, my house, my body. I lay it down with myself. I have the power to lay it down. I have power to take it again. This command I received from my father. Moses didn't have that authority. Nobody has that kind of authority over their body. But Jesus had that authority over his own house, over his temple, over the flesh that he put on. We are his house. We are built by him. We are a place for him to dwell in. And he is the Lord over our house. If we hold fast to the confidence and rejoicing of the hope. If we continue in these things, and the Hebrews need to know this is endurance. You have changed. You are now a fulfilled Jew. You are now someone who's not just in a cult or in a whim or a trend. You have to, and I love it because it says we have to hold fast to the confidence, not just the teachings, but confidence in it. It proves we are his. Again, being reminded to hold fast, continue, give the more earnest heed. This theme will come up over and over again in Hebrews. And the author goes back to another supporting scripture from the Old Testament related to Moses and those who followed him, showing that following Christ will have some of the same experiences that challenged their forefathers and went through in the wilderness. And we'll be looking at that because it's going to be in Psalm 95, 7 through 11. It's going to liken our journey with Jesus similar to the children of Israel who followed Moses and had to follow him through the wilderness. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much that these truths show us that you are worthy of more glory and honor than Moses. And Moses is really neat. But Lord, you are the builder of the house and not the house. And we thank you that through this book, we are considering Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession. We're getting to know more and more of what it meant when we said, I agree that you are Lord and everything that pertains to that. May these truths find their way into the fabric of our confidence so that we understand that we are partakers of this heavenly calling and that we can be faithful in the mission you called us on, just like Moses was, whose house we are. We are your house, just like Moses was your house. And that, Lord, we want to be faithful to you who has appointed us. In Jesus' name, amen.